H. P. Lovecraft The Horror at Red Hook Part 1 Not many weeks ago, on a street corner in the village of Pasco, Rhode Island, a tall, heavy-built, and wholesome-looking pedestrian furnished much speculation by a singular lapse of behavior. He had, it appears, been descending the hill by the road from Chapay, and encountering the compact section, had turned to his left into the main thoroughfare, where several modest business blocks convey a touch of the urban. At this point, without visible provocation, he committed his astonished lapse, and staring queerly for a second at the tallest of the buildings before him, and then, with a series of terrified, hysterical shrieks, breaking into a frantic run, which ended in a stumble and a fall at the next crossing, picked up and dusted off by ready hands, he was found to be conscious, organically unhurt, and evidently cured of his sudden nervous attack. He muttered some shamefaced explanation involving a strain he had undergone, and with a downcast glance, turned back up at the Chopé Road, trudged out of sight without once looking behind him. It was a strange incident to befall so large, robust, normal-featured, and capable-looking a man, and the strangeness was not lessened by the remarks of a bystander who had recognized him as the border of a well-known dairyman upon the outskirts of Chapay. He was a developed a New York police detective named Thomas F. Malone, who, on a long leave of absence under medical treatment, after some disproportionately arduous work, upon a gruesome local case, which accident had made dramatic. There had been a collapse of several old brick buildings during a raid in which he had shared, and something about the wholesale loss of life, both of prisoners and of his companions, had particularly appalled him. As a result, he had acquired an accurate and anomalous horror of any buildings even remotely suggesting the ones which had fallen in, so that in the end mental specialists forbade him the sight of such things for an indefinite period. A police surgeon with relatives in Chopin had put forward the quaint hamlet of wooden colonial houses as an ideal spot for the psychological convalescence, and thither the sufferer had gone, promising never to venture among the brick-lined streets of a larger village till the duly advised by the wood-worn so socket specialist with whom he was put in touch. This walk to Pasco for magazines had been a mistake, and the patient had paid in fright, bruises, and a humiliation for his disobedience. So much the gossip of Chapay and Pasco were, and so much also the most learned specialists believed. But Malone had first told the specialists much more, ceasing only when he saw the utter incredulity was his portion. Therefore he began to hold his peace, protesting not at all when it was generally agreed that the collapse of certain squalid brick houses in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, and the consequent death of many brave officers, had unseated his nervous equilibrium. He had worked too hard, Paul said, in trying to clean up those nests of disorder and violence. Certain features were shocking enough, in all conscience, and the unexpected tragedy was the last straw. This was a simple explanation, which everyone could understand, and because Malone was not a simple person, he perceived that he had better let it suffice. To hint to the unimaginative people, of a horror beyond all human conception, a horror of houses and blocks and cities, leprous and cancerous, with evil dragged from the elder worlds. Though well, that would merely to invite a padded cell instead of restful restification, 
and Malone was a man of sense, despite his mysticism. He had the Celt's far vision of the weird and hidden things. But the logician's quick eye for the outwardly unconvincing, an amalgam which had led him far afield in the forty-two years of his life, and set him in a strange place for Dublin University, a man born in Georgian Villa near Phoenix Park. And now as he reviewed the things he had seen, and felt, and apprehended, Malone was content to keep unshared the secret of what could reduce a dauntless fighter to a quavering neurotic. What could make the old brick slums and the seas of dark, subtle faces a thing of nightmare and eldritch portent? It would not be the first time his senses had been forced to bid uninterrupted. For was not his very act of plunging into the polyglot abyss of New York's underworld a freak beyond sensible explanation? What could he tell the prosaic of the antique witcheries and grotesque marvels discernible to sensitive eye amidst the poison cauldron where all the very dregs of unwholesome ages mix their venom and perpetuate their obscene terrors. He had seen the hellish green flame of secret wonder in this blatant, evasive welter of outward greed and inward blasphemy, and had smiled gently when all the New Yorkers he knew scoffed at his experiment in police work. They had been very witty and cynical deriding his fantastic pursuit of the unknowable mysteries, and assuring him that in these days New York held nothing but cheapness and vulgarity. One of them had wagered him a heavy sum that he could not, despite many poignant things to his credit in the Dublin Review, even write a truly interesting story of the New York lowlife. And now, looking back, he perceived that cosmic irony had justified the prophet's words, while secretly confuting their flippant meaning. The horror, as glimpsed at last, could not make a story, for like the book cited by Poe's German authority, Elas sich nicht lesen, it does not permit itself to be read.